going to eventually meander into Genesis 1 again. So if you have your Bible, you could open it to that. We're going to be going uh, to a few Psalms as well. And I'll have uh, the passages uh, behind me as well. So if you don't want to flip through or uh, didn't bring uh, a Bible, it's no problem because you'll be able to see everything here. As the first slide suggests, we're going to talk about Genesis and other creation accounts. Now, when I say other creation accounts, I, of course, mean other creation accounts that existed and were put forth by other civilizations in the ancient world, Israel's neighbors, okay, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, Babylonians, that sort of thing. But whether you realize it or not, there are actually creation account passages in the Old Testament that do not sound like Genesis 1. Okay, so you also have other creation accounts in the Bible itself. And so I want to sort of give you as much as is possible in a limited amount of time a feel for the ancient worldview that all of these creation cosmologies and cosmogonies uh, had. Basically, those are two terms that refer to how everything got here and who made it and who ordered it, arranged it, all that sort of thing. And of course, Israel's view was that the God of Israel did that very naturally. And of course, the competitive views were some deity or a group of deities in their own pantheons were responsible. So there's There's competition. There's theological competition. There's a shared worldview. And I think when when we see how a lot of the ideas are the same and overlap, when we get to the Israelite stuff, you're going to be able to see much more clearly why a writer is doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying, even though it's going to sound really strange at points. I want to try to give you the backdrop to be able to parse some of the things that are going on in passages. Because if you just read them, they're going to sound really strange. But with the context, it'll it'll start clicking in your mind, okay, I know exactly what he's shooting at here. I know why he's saying that, because of this idea and this competing uh, theology next door. So with that said, we need to fix a few obvious things in our mind. Biblical creation accounts were written at different times by different people in different contexts with different goals than, of course, our own. And even with respect to each other, they had agendas. Agenda is not a bad word. They just had purpose in what they were doing. However, again, when it comes to biblical creation stories, even if they don't look the same on the surface, They do have one unified goal, and the goal is theological. It's not about giving us scientific method or scientific jargon or talking. It's about theologically being correct. Who created everything? Who's responsible? Who should get the credit? And who shouldn't? Now, for Mesopotamia... Some of you might have been exposed to some of this stuff. It's, very, it's really quite strange. If you've ever read any sort of maybe a Pacific Northwest Indian account or a Native American creation story or really anything outside the Bible, you get essentially battling deities and you get really weird conceptual ideas. You get, you know, divine animals doing this or that to each other and interacting with gods and goddesses and people. To our ear, it's really strange because, again, for the most part, you you go to Genesis and it's like God just speaks and there it is. And you have an orderly succession. Part of the reason for this, and Mesopotamia is going to fit into the odd category, is that they're struggling with answering some fundamental questions. How did everything get here? And who put it there? And if we sort of know or state our belief in who put it there, well, how did they get here? Okay, now we ask the same questions, or we get the same questions asked of us. 
you know, we, we affirm that God's the creator. And somebody, you know, is going to ask, well, where did God come from? And we talk about self-existence, you know, that he always existed and so on and so forth. A lot of ancient civilizations didn't really have that idea. Everything had to come from something. But some of them sort of gave up <laughs> and said, okay, in, in, in the very beginning there was a deity or a group of deities. So that's one set of struggles. The other is they don't have any kind of scientific background or vocabulary like we do. But they, they live in the world. They can see that there's a relationship between living things. And in the ancient world, there was speculation on all this stuff that we see. It, it's probably made from just a few things. They, they, would, they would be called primal or primeval elements. And when I use the word element, I'm not talking about science, like hydrogen, and, you know, nothing like that. They thought if you could reduce everything that we see into the basic things, what would it be? Now, maybe you might remember this from high school history or history of Civ or something like that. Some candidates for how an ancient person would parse this would be what? Everything is made up of... Also, if you're into 70s music, you could probably answer this question. <laughs> Earth, wind, <laughs> fire, and water is the fourth. Those were usually perceived as the four primal elements. Again, this isn't scientific at all, but all the, everything else is probably made from one of those. Uh, in the case of Mesopotamia, what they did was they came up with the notion that there are actually two groups of gods. There are the gods who interacted with people. Those are the ones who show up in their stories. You know, the god or goddess did this or that. But before those gods, there were other gods because the, the other older gods had to make the ones that we interact with because they got to come from somewhere. So they actually had two groups. And the oldest group, they sort of deified or they made the primary elemental stuff. They described things like earth, wind, fire, and water as though they were gods to, to start off the story. Because they had a sense that everything comes from somewhere, something that we experience, but they have no scientific knowledge, so they're not talking about chemistry, okay? But what they, what they do figure is, you know, for all that stuff to get here, it had to be, you know, it, it had, there had to be life force in it. And so they just characterized primary elements as though they were persons, gods and goddesses. Because what they're going to do is they're going to say, the gods and the goddesses that represent these primal elements are going to get together, and often the, the, the description is a sexual one, but they're going to get together and then produce other things in the natural world and other deities that represent natural things. Again, this is completely pre-scientific. So where does every living thing come from, the ancient Mesopotamia would ask? How do we get living things? Very normal answer. If you don't know any science, you say, well, living things come because of sex. Animals reproduce. Okay, that produces a living thing. And living things come from the ground. Okay, plants, they grow. They don't know anything, again, beyond that level. What sustains life? Here's another way to look at where we get everything. What things must you have to have life? Well, semen, because that goes with the, the copulation idea, that produces life somehow. They're not geneticists, but they know that that produces life. And blood is important because, hey, like out in the battlefield, if you get cut and, and you just bleed a lot, you're going to die. So ergo, you must need that red stuff <laughs> to stay alive. And... We all have that red stuff in us, so that must really be important. That must carry life. They also could know that I can't just go out in the water and, like, breathe it because then I'm going to drown. Okay, so air must be important. And, you know, naturally, you have to have water 
You have to drink it a certain amount to stay alive. So that, again, there's these very natural ideas that come from the world they live in. Again, but all those things were made from things that were prior. And so they're trying to explain this. This is why when you read ancient creation accounts across the board, and in this instance, the Israelite material is somewhat exceptional. It's very exceptional. When you read ancient creation accounts, this is why the gods have sex with each other in creation stories. This is why humans are created with blood or humans are grown from the ground or they're built out of something. Because to the pre-scientific mind, that's where you get stuff. That's how you make living things. That's how you make anything. That's the language of their experience. Okay, it's not that they're trying to be crude and produce something that would be offensive or titillating. It's, that's where things come from. It's just our experience. So let's get into a couple. In Mesopotamia, you have in their conception at the beginning, there was just water. All right. And the water itself, this watery, it's just water, the watery abyss it's often referred to, has two sides. It has a male and a female. Again, they're thinking everything came from this watery place, but to produce things, you have to have a male and a female. And so we'll name part of the watery place, we'll give it one name that's the male, and the other part of the watery place is a female, and they're going to get together and multiply. Again, the language of experience. So in this version, we have two natural forces come together and produce two more. So we have the two watery male and female. We have the mud and the sister version. They get together and they produce two more, heaven and earth, the whole heaven and the whole earth. The result of all this divine cohabitation, and, it, and it's spoken of in sexual terms in the texts, is that we have all the elements, the primary elements that we need, all existing together. They had to start with an original pair. But the heavens and earth that we experience as Mesopotamians was not made yet. That's still coming. Here's what happens next. This is the Sumerian version. So you have your primeval deities, your elements, existing in this watery abyss, and they get busy. The male side and the female side get together and they produce on, which is the Sumerian word for heaven. This is the heaven that humans see, that they experience. They get together again and they produce earth. Now, I have them labeled as husband and brother or wife and sister because they're going to marry each other to produce more things. And what they produce is the Sumerian pantheon. All the deities that are going to do nasty things to humans and do nice things to humans and fight with each other, they're, they're produced from these other deities. Now, one of these other deities, the leader, his name is Anlil. And eventually in the story, he's going to displace On, the heaven. He's, he wants to rule the heavens. He has a brother named Anki, who's important in another version. This one over here. This is the Babylonian version. Now, in terms of chronology, Sumeria, just call it 3000, 2500 BC. Babylonian version is like 1500 years later. Okay, but they're going to have their own version. We have Apsu, again, the male side of the watery abyss. He's disturbed by the other primeval element gods in there. He doesn't like them. And so he plans to destroy them. The plot is discovered by one of these other deities, Anki. And he says, I can't let that happen because the gods are okay. You know, without them, we wouldn't be here. It's just not fair. So he gets rid of Apsu. <laughs> he stops the plot. And eventually, he's going to have a son named Marduk, because the gods are always having babies. Okay? 
Marduk is the head of the pantheon in Babylon. He is viewed as the creator of the heaven and earth that, that the people experience. And in this version, his female counterpart is a goddess called Tiamat. She is always pictured as a dragon or some kind of water beast. Okay? They don't get along. <laughs> they have a fight, and Marduk kills Tiamat. Now, the interesting thing is what he does with her body. Because he still wants to make heaven and earth. So he splits her body in two pieces. And one part he makes into heaven. And the other part he makes into earth. So the story is that of a single deity, Marduk, killing some weird sort of dragon beast. And out of her body making heaven and earth. And then everything's wonderful. Everything's orderly. Okay. The, the, the forces of evil have been subdued and destroyed. So that's the Babylonian version. Now you'll recall from our talk last week that we said Genesis can be read in such a way that you have pre-existing material that God returns to or you know, gets around to ordering. And that can be you know, the way we understand Genesis. And if you remember from last week, the first creative act then would be in verse 3. So you could have the same sort of feel that in the Mesopotamian version, Marduk takes material, it's the body of Tiamat, he splits it, he severs it, he separates it. Keep the word separation in your mind. And out of the separation comes heaven and earth, and so he's using material that is available to him, and he brings about heaven and earth. So there's a, a loose conceptual parallel there. The problem is, how does this really relate to Genesis 1, 1 through 3, other than the big concept? Because you look at it, where is the dragon? I'll give you a second to read it. Can you find the dragon? Anybody who can find this dragon will win, ought to win some kind of geek award uh, because you've been, you've been reading all the stuff that I typically read. <laughs> Where's the dragon? Yes. Well, yeah, that's cheating. <laughs> Is the dragon there or not? You say, well, how is the deep the dragon? Because the word deep in Hebrew is tehom, which is the Hebrew equivalent to tiamat. Now, when Mesopotamian stuff was first deciphered in the late 19th century, Hebrew scholars, Semitic scholars, who finally cracked cuneiform to translate it, they came across tiamat, in certain texts, creation texts, splitting the body. And they thought of the Genesis story because of the word and because God separates this from that. And, you know, they're thinking, well, oh, there, there must be some relationship here. And here we have this word. That's kind of weird, you know. And then you'd read further on in the flood story. Well, there, there was a flood story. There were several flood stories from Babylon. And people started to, their imagination really started to run wild with this, where you were literally seeing a Babylonian piece of mythology behind Genesis everywhere. It was an overreaction. It became known as pan-Babylonianism. It means we just see Babylon, Babylonian stuff everywhere in Genesis. But there was this link, okay? So they, they knew something was going on. Nowadays, people have backed away from this. Even, even the most rank liberal scholar would not say that Genesis comes from Mesopotamian material. That says too much, because there really is no battle. Yeah, we might have Tiamat there, but there's no battle. To home, everywhere else it occurs in the Hebrew Bible is never used as though it was a person. It's never, you know, in any kind of, you know, creating anything context. There are other Old Testament creation accounts that do have God slaying a dragon, 
We're going to get to those tonight. But the word to home is never in them. Okay. And so they thought this was a wrong headed idea. Something's going on here, but it's not this Mesopotamian stuff. You know, it's sort of, it, it's, it's, it looks like it's there, but it's really not that good. This is more or less my observation on it. If you look at Tahom, let's just do a little theology here. Let's say that Tahom does represent the forces of chaos. Everywhere else, in, you know, not everywhere else, but many, many places in the Old Testament, you get this idea of the raging sea as being synonymous with disorder and chaos. What if that is what's going on in Genesis? Well, Genesis has it already subdued. The forces of chaos are already subdued. You know, you get this feel that the water's still and the Spirit of God's hovering over the water. And God says, let's get to work. God orders everything. He gets to the end and says, it's all good. It's all very good. But chaos is still there. In other words, God doesn't eliminate it. It's just under control. I don't want to rabbit trail on that too much, but we always wonder why, why is there evil? Why is there unpredictability in the world? And an Israelite would say it's because God subdued it, controls it, and lets it exist. It is part of the creation. It's what he wanted, and he sustains it and, and controls it. Now, if he would remove his hand from it, which some prophecies say he's going to do at some point, then we have problems. So Genesis presents a world that has unpredictability built into it, but God is in control of it. But there is no mythological battle. There is in earlier creation stories, stuff that comes prior to this Babylonian feel, and I'm going to skip through a lot of this real quickly. In the 1920s, late 1920s, 1930s, there was a place known as Ugarit. It's, just, it's in ancient Syria. It was an old city-state. It was destroyed around 1200 BC. And that's really secure because there are literally tablets that come from Ugarit that are, were taken out of the ovens by archaeologists that say, the enemy's coming to get us. We're all going to die. I mean, <laughs> they're still in the oven. Uh, so it, it's pretty secure that, yeah, we kind of know when they were destroyed. Um, it's kind of like Pompeii in that respect. Just you, you got like a, a snapshot in time. Some of this stuff uh, deals with a lot of this creation language. The people at Ugar at ancient Syria, which if you remember your biblical geography, if you've got Israel as sort of the perpendicular country that it is, and down here is the Dead Sea, and a little, little ways up here is Sea of Galilee, and then up here you've got Syria. Okay, Syria is right next door to the northern kingdom of Israel. Syria, Ugarit, was the hub for Baal worship. It's one of the reasons why the prophets just went crazy all the time with Baal, because they lived next door, and it, it was the ideas were seeping over into Israelite religion. Plus, if you know your, your, your biblical history, once Solomon dies and the kingdom splits, what does Jeroboam do? What's one of the first things he does? His people say, well, this was really a great idea, Jeroboam. You know, like, okay, we didn't want taxes, and, you know, we've seceded from the union now, and there's ten tribes here, and we're doing our own thing, but you, you left out one detail, the temples in the other territory. So, like, what do we do? We're supposed to go down there a few times a year to worship, and we've got all these festivals. We're like, did you overlook that? And so Jeroboam's answer is, yeah, I kind of did overlook that. <laughs> His solution is, well, we'll just have our own temple up here. We'll just make our own centers of worship. Because he didn't want people going down to the south because they might defect. He might lose them. And they start their own system of worship. And it's filled with Baalism because those are their neighbors. This is where Elijah has the famous confrontation. Choose you today which God you're going to serve. That, that happens in the north at Carmel. So you've got this context going on. And it, the literature 
from this part of the ancient world has several key deities. Baal is the one we all know and don't love. There's another one named Yam, which is the word for sea. Nahar is river. There's Tanun, which is a dragon. Litanu, which is also a, a, a sea dragon. In Ugaritic thinking, their creation thinking, again, the sea, Yam, was the, the force of chaos and had to be defeated. And so in their stories, Baal does all that. Baal destroys the dragon. Baal's the great you know, God, the sustainer of everything. You know, he's... He, he supposedly dies and then comes back from the dead, and, you know, but there's a big debate over that. But he's the guy. In the Hebrew Bible, you will find a number of places where Yahweh, the God of Israel, is described in Baal terminology. Why do they do that? Because the biblical writer wants it to be clear to his readers that no, it isn't Baal who did this or this, this or that great thing. It isn't some other, you know, God that the foreigners worship. El was their other big deity. It's Yahweh. And so the writers are very familiar with their literature. And they'll take phrases and episodes and vocabulary out of the pagan literature, import it into what they're writing in the Hebrew Bible, and literally change the names and they will give the God of Israel credit. It's a theological technique. It's a polemic. We use the word polemic. You know, if, if we could pretend to ourselves, if we didn't have a Bible, try to pretend we don't have a Bible, and we're sitting here, and we don't like the powers that be, the authority figures, whether they be religious or political, and somehow we're sure that God is leading us to produce our own record, our own theological correction of, of what, what we should believe. One of the things we might do is we might hear a claim of some other deity or some authority figure taking credit for something. I'm responsible for, you know, the crops that grow. And if people were familiar with that, we could say, okay, I'm going to take a shot at that. While I'm writing my history of what God, who the true God really is, I'm going to take that claim, bring it in here, and I'm going to set the record straight. Biblical writers did that all the time. It's a slap in the face of whoever gets displaced in the text. Now, I mention all that to, to bring us to Psalm 74. Look at this psalm. God is my king. My king is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided, you separated the sea. The Hebrew word is also yam, just like it is in Ugaritic. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters. The Hebrew word is tanin. It's the word for dragons. The sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. Leviathan is the Hebrew spelling of litanu, which is what comes out of the Ugar Ugaritic material. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up the ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. Well, when did that happen? At creation. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. Yeah. You've made summer and winter. All those things happen at creation. The earth is formed. The seas are gathered into one place and are still. The boundaries of habitation are fixed. The seasons go into effect with the sun, moon, and stars. They're light holders. And Genesis 1 tells you they're you know, for seasons and times and all this sort of stuff. This is a creation text, but it doesn't sound anything like, you know, in some places, like Genesis 1. But it's communicating the same idea. Who brought everything into existence? Who brought order out of chaos? Who defeats chaos? 
who defeats the forces of the natural elements that if left alone, they're just going to go nuts. Who does that? Is it Baal? No. It's yet God my king from of old. It's the God of Israel. This is a classic example of a creation text that looks on the surface different than Genesis 1, but is saying the same thing. It's got nothing to do with science unless you believe that origins, scientific origins, involve slaying a dragon. Okay, there are no mythological dragons. Okay, that isn't how the world came to be. A dragon dies somewhere in the sea. Okay, we know this. But to them, you have to realize that these characters in the story represent deities that are either good or evil. And they fight. There's combat. And the Mesopotamians say, one won, Marduk won. And he, he, you know, thank goodness he won because we have an orderly world now that we can experience and live in. The people of Ugarit would say, no, it's not Marduk. He's a flunky. It was Baal. Baal's the one that came out on top. He's the one that brings order out of chaos. And the Egyptians, it's somebody else. Depending on what city you lived in, it could be three or four different gods in Egypt. But for the Israelite, when the Israelite writes what we have in our Old Testament, in our creation accounts, he's not thinking, okay, how am I going to present a scientific account of how everything came to be when I don't know science, nobody who's going to read it will know scientific language, but in the future they will. This isn't the point. His job, again, under, in the context of inspiration, his job is we cannot let this bad theology go unaddressed. Okay? It's theological messaging. Now, I have an arrow here for the wilderness, pointing at the wilderness. Does that sound incongruous? Well, if it's the sea, how do you get the wilderness in the sea? Anybody notice that? The wilderness thing? It's because, let me ask you, the, let me just ask in the form of a question. Was there anything else that had to do with water that God acted upon that was perceived as an act of creation that wasn't the original creation? God, water, what was that? Come on. He said, when, what other place does water get split? The Red Sea. You will find other passages where this creation language is brought up in the description of the deliverance from Egypt. Because in the Israelite mind, that was just as dramatic that was just as epic as creation. Because the gods of Egypt were defeated at the sea. Pharaoh is a god. Okay, is he not? They get through, and what does Miriam do? She sings, O oh Yahweh, who among you is like the gods? You know, you have this long song, you know, when, when you get through Exodus, the crossing. God defeats the forces of chaos again by delivering Israel from Egypt and destroying their gods by showing I'm the one that controls the fate of mankind, not these idiots in Egypt, okay? There's, these passages are just, you know, pregnant with theology. I mean, they're... they're they're just, they're, you know, to use the watery metaphor, they're spilling over with these little touch points. Why is it that up until Exodus, the God of Israel is not known as Yahweh? He's known as the God of the fathers. El Shaddai, El this, El that. Okay, God reveals his name at Sinai and says, I'm the God of your fathers. Yeah, that's me. But my name is I am. 
which in Hebrew, when the first person speaker is speaking, is eh, yeah. When you refer to that person, the pronunciation is Yahweh. And Yahweh, you know what it means? He who causes to be. It's from Hayah, the to be verb. Well, why would he say my name is the one who causes things to be? Because, like, we got some creative work here that needs to be done. Like, you used to be a nation, and you went down to Egypt, and you've been there for 400 years, and now I'm going to act. It's going to be like an, an act of new creation. I'm creating something that really doesn't exist anymore, and I'm going to bring it to be. I'm going to bring what is not to be. That's why you get the name. Again, all these ideas are connected. If you look at Psalm 89, let's see if my link will work here. Psalm 89 is just, is really, again, another a fascinating example here, if I can get it to open. There we go. Just, let's just read through you know, parts of Psalm 89. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. In my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Again, this is a scene in heaven, God surrounded by the heavenly host. Again, divine counsel terminology. You've heard me use that term before. It's just God in the heavenly host. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Lord in all caps is Yahweh. Who among the heavenly beings? The Hebrew literally has who among the sons of the gods is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging sea. You rule over Yom. When its, wa its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahav like a carcass. Okay, Rahav here is another word for the sea beast, the chaos beast. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it. You have founded them, the north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, <clears throat> high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. Let's go down here a little ways. We'll skip a few verses for speed. Come on. Of, you, of old, you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. So that my hand shall be established with him, my arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, the wicked will not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. It's repeating a lot of the language that we've seen before. And then he says about David, I will set his hand on the sea. I will put his hand... Okay, the right hand of authority, okay, over the sea. This is very obviously messianic because only God can do that. Only God can control the forces of chaos. David can't do that. He's just a guy. Okay, but a Davidic king who is also Yahweh can pull that off. Okay, I will set his hand on the sea at his right hand on the Nahar, Remember the other name in the Ugaritic text for the deity, the water deity, Nahar? His right hand on the, on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. You know what the word highest there is? 
Let's see if we can just click through to our interlinear and actually use that thing. It's Elyon, Most High. Elyon in the Semitic world was a title for guess who? Baal. It's one of the titles of Baal that gets applied to Yahweh. God is saying, you know, not only am I the real Most High, but the king, I will set his hand over the seas. He will be the Most High. I will make him the firstborn. Is that a familiar term? Firstborn is a rank of authority. Jesus is called firstborn. How many? I mean, you see these connections. Okay, firstborn, most high, ruling over, the, over chaos. I mean, this is a Davidic psalm that rehearses the Davidic covenant, the covenant God made with David to have the everlasting dynasty. It's full of this you know, creation imagery that an Israelite would have gone, wow, man, that's going to be great. You know, what a guy. You know? And more than that, he would be thinking, well, you know, I kind of I watched David grow up. How's he going to do that? You know, only God can do that. Either, either this king is going to be like God on earth, or maybe we'll have God on earth as the king. That's kind of the way it would seem to work. I mean, they're Israelites. They don't have the New Testament, but they've got these pieces of the picture going through their heads. Let's go back here. There are New Testament implications to this. Anybody know what happens in Mark 4? Everybody's going to cheat quick. <laughs> well, let's go there. We'll save some time. To an, I mean, think about it. To an Israelite. I mean, these guys have their Old Testament. They've got the worldview in their brains. They know these, the stories. They're Semites. They're Israelites. This guy Jesus comes along and he claims to be the son of God. Son of God, king of Israel. Man, it sounds a lot like Psalm 89. Ooh, boy, that's kind of weird. And he comes to them one day or one night. You know, one, on that day when evening had come, he said, them, let's go across to their side. Leaving the boat, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And we know the whole story. He goes out onto the, the rough and raging sea and says, quiet. And it is. And their reaction is like, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what did we just see? Okay, if they're clicking it all up here, they know what that, I mean, he's God. And more than that, if... If, you know, John or somebody got up that morning and read Psalm 89 in his devotions, he's thinking, man, his hand shall, you know, I'll put his hand over this. They're, they're just, they're clicking. They're just clicking with these little, these little tidbits in the text. I mean, this isn't, this isn't a story placed in here just because Mark's like, man, I'm a few lines short of a column. What do I put in here, you know? No, I mean, it's deliberate. It's messaging. We go back, we get Matthew 14. It's, again, somewhat similar. It's walking on the water. The chaos has no effect on me. In fact, I tread on it. Again, the, mentally up here, the pieces are just floating around in their head. And Jesus will do things. Or he'll say things. You know, I mean, after three and a half years of this, it's no wonder that he looks at him and says, haven't I been with you three and a half years and you don't get this yet? I mean, how could you miss this? We have a few minutes. We'll hit Egypt a little bit. Now, oh my font. See, we didn't check the font, Dax. <laughs> in Egypt, the watery abyss. If you can't read that, it says Heliopolitan theology. Egyptian creation theology and Egyptian religion generally change depending on what city was the capital city. Because where the pharaoh wants to live, he sort of gets to decide what the doctrine is. 
But generally, one of the fundamental, one of the main versions of this is called the Heliopolitan theology. So you have the same idea, except in Egypt, they're not really thinking of the primeval deities as specific elements like water and dirt and all that stuff. They think of them as conditions, what it was like when there was nothing or before there was everything. And so they, they take some of the terminology for conditions to represent, be represented by uh, deities. But the primary deity that emerges, and I catch the language here, in this theology, the creator, Atum, who later becomes known as Ra, emerges from this watery thing. He's always been there. He just didn't come out. So they, they believed in a pre-existent deity, at least the writers of this theology. Ra, Atum, emerges and starts to do what all the other deities do. I've got to bring order okay, out of this chaotic mess. He emerges from the noon, the watery abyss. So he is responsible for his own existence. So he's thought of as self-created. Atum, Ra, creates the world as the Egyptians know it. And we'll skip ahead. And what Atum Ra does, back to our, where does everything come from? How would we describe that if, we, if we're not scientists? The original pairing that Atum Ra creates, Shu, the dry air, and Tefnut, the moist air, the, the, it varies. Some say he did that by spitting. Okay, so there you get, the, you get a watery idea and air. Others say he used his own semen to produce them. Um, some say it's a combination of both. But again, they're not trying to be titillating. They're not trying to be crude. They're saying, where does stuff come from? Oh, you got sex, you got planting, you got building stuff. I mean, again, this is the language of experience. And so it varies with the story. These two deities get together. And they father Earth, whose name is Geb, and Newt, who is Sky. And then they get together, and they're real busy. They're going to have four kids. Osiris, who will inherit the lordship of Earth from Geb. Isis, she is the sister and the wife of Osiris. We have Nephthys and the bad guy, Seth, and they're also a couple. So to the Egyptian, this is where all, again, the things that we experience in our created world are the result of the creative power of Atum-Ra, who was uncreated, and he arose from this watery abyss. And they never, if you'd ask them, well, where'd the watery abyss come from? Their answer would be, well, those were the olden deities that were just kind of there. And they don't interact with people. But, but out of them, Ra came and then brought everything else that we know and interact with. This group was known as the Aeneid, which is the nine. And there's one missing, and the one missing is Horus, who is the offspring of, of Isis and Osiris in the story. And it's from him that kingship descends from the gods. Every pharaoh is the incarnation of Horus. He is Horus on earth. Okay, so there's actually nine. This is how an Egyptian, if he had a very, very cheap graphics program, would have drawn the first time. <laughs> That's how an Egyptian would say in the beginning, the first time, at the first time. So you have a mound come up with Atum Ra on it. Hey, I'm here. Thought I'd wake up and actually do something here. Uh, I've been like in this watery abyss for forever. Ha <laughs> ha, joke. Okay. Because there is no time yet. <laughs> I've been here forever. I thought I'd come out. He rises up on this mound. By the way, the mound shape, this is why they did the pyramidal thing. Okay, The capstone, pyramidal capstone on a lot of their architecture. That was to commemorate the first time, the original mound. This is why in Egyptian temples, if you go in at the gate and you walk, there's a straight axis, you walk. It's a, it's a very, it's, it's discernible by, by experience, but you couldn't really see it visually. The ground goes up at a very light, slow grade. 
And as you're walking toward what's at the end, and of course at the end, what would there be? The mound, okay? At the end, you know, the buildings are decorated as though it's the watery abyss. Okay, you have little, you know, papyrus plants on the walls, and there's lots of water drawn, and there's the sky up above. It's a recreation, a recommemoration of the emergence of all that is. That's what happens in the temple. Okay, it re, it's a reenactment. It's also why the god at the end sometimes is put in a little boat. Because there's water there. You've got to watch out. You don't want to get him wet. Genesis 1, 9 to 10. How many times have we read this? God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. How do you do that? If this was like an IQ test, how do you do that? How do you gather all the waters into one place and then call them seas, plural? How do you do that? And there's dry land there. So you got dry land, you got waters in one place, but you've got plural seas. Can anybody draw that for me? Yeah, with a better graphics program. That's what it looks like. The waters are in one place. But depending on your orientation, you could be at a different sea. And the land is in the middle. Now next week, we're going to see a whole series of verses that describe this in the Old Testament. The edges, you know, where, this, where the, the sky meets the land at the curve and the edge. Old Testament cosmology is a round earth surrounded by water over which is the sky. And then underneath is what? It's the bad place. Have you ever wondered where we get this idea that hell is like down there? It's from the Old Testament because that's where Sheol is. That's the Old Testament word for Sheol. Our conception comes right out of, again, the Judeo-Christian worldview. I could show you another text. Egypt, there's one other theology. It's called the Memphite theology. You know, we, you, you look at, in Genesis 1, who gets credit for gathering the seas into one place and the land emerging? Okay, it's Yahweh. It's a, you don't find that in, in Babylonian stories. You don't find that at Ugarit. You do find it in Egypt. So the writer writing the Old Testament says, well, okay, I... I kind of slapped the Ugaritic people around. I, I dissed Baal sufficiently. And I took a swipe at Marduk, got him. Who's left? Uh, the Egyptians. Well, okay, we need to make sure that in our account that our messaging is clear. Because if we leave the Egyptians go, someone might get the mistaken impression that they're actually right somewhere. But they're not. Even the creation with the spoken word, Genesis 1, God speaks and things come into existence. That occurs only one other place in the ancient world. It's, it's very rare. And that is Egypt. There's a, a, a theology, a, a creation story in Egypt with the God's name is Ta in that case. Again, capital's Memphis, so we rewrite the story and put our patron God in charge. And in that version, Ta when he brings all the Aeneid into existence. See if we have our text open here. We read things like this. There was evolution into Atum's image through both heart and the tongue. And great and important is Ta, who gave life to all the gods and their cause, as well as through, his, through this heart and this tongue. So the way Ta creates is through the heart in Egypt was the seat of emotions and intellect. Again, they're not doing brain science. His thought and his speech is what produces everything. It has evolved that heart and tongue have control of all the limbs, blah, 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 so on and so forth. He does whatever he wants, don't they all? <clears throat> His Aeneid is before him in teeth and lips. It's with the mouth. He creates with the mouth. That seed in those hands of Atum. So what the other guys were writing about Atum doing this with 
his seed, you know, his semen and his hands building stuff. Ta really did that, and he did it in an even superior way. He just spoke. He just thought and spoke, and then it happened. Take that. Okay. Again, this is, this is earlier than biblical material. So, again, the writer's sitting around, well, did we, you know, did we address Egypt enough? You know, we want to be, you know, we want to be theologically clear. We want people to know who the creator really is. So, like, you know, did we miss anything? And some scribe, some snotty student shows up and says, oh, yeah, you missed Ta. Okay? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying, I'm being a little, a little trivial, a little, you know, a little flippant, you know, with the examples. But I want you to get the idea of what they're doing. They are, they are intellectually putting a lot of effort into how do we express who the creator is and, and make it theologically correct so that no one can read this and go away thinking that any other deity anywhere had anything to do with this other than Yahweh. So they're shooting. They're going after the, the competing ideas. And they're hitting their mark. Now to us, you know, we look at this and, you know, half the time, I, I know what it feels like. You know, you read the Old Testament, it's like, man, that's just bizarre. And trust me, there are passages I read and just... I have no idea what's going on there. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> I'll mark that one down to go visit again. Uh, because we just don't have this in our head. We don't know who Ta is. We don't know who Ra is. We don't know who Atum is. We don't know what the noon is. We don't know what... You know. They did. Because as a Jew, you interact with Egypt a lot. You certainly interacted with them during the captivity. You interact with them through the rest of your history, either nicely with trade or badly with military conflict. Egypt controlled Palestine for hundreds and hundreds of years in biblical days. You certainly interacted with the Babylonians. You basically spent 70 years there stewing, telling, you know, listening to them tell you that their God defeated yours. Oh, you know those stories. Okay, they, they remind you. I mean, they, they know. This is their worldview. So I, I wanted to try to give you a little exposure to that because when you read through, and these aren't the only ones, when you read through the Old Testament, strange names, strange place names, you should, you should spend a little time looking those up. You'll be surprised Again, use a Bible dictionary or Bible handbook and look some of those things up. What happens at those places at other times? Which deity was supposed to control that place? Okay. Why does that deity get that name? Does that name show up anywhere else? Okay. There's all this kind of stuff going on under the surface. And again, with Genesis, with creation, Again, just leaving you with the thought, it's about theological messaging. That's what they're going after. Now, we have pretty much ended right on time. So we took 10 or 15 minutes questions last time. You may fire away. Ask me. Yes, Bradley, go ahead. So if I see something like uh, God that the Jews have a big bang, Yeah, that 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 is the. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not going to suggest that because you know even scientists will will bicker. I mean, Stephen Hawking now he rejects the Big Bang, so uh, it it is the way it's expressed in the scientific community can on a on a conceptual, theological, and polemic level be essentially saying the same sort of thing, the same idea. Because as soon as you take, it, it, let's say you're a Big Bang cosmologist, and you say, well, this is the way we as 21st century people express this, the, the moment when everything came into being. Again, try to dismiss from your head for a moment, well, where'd the stuff come from that caused the Big Bang? Try to put that aside. 
Okay, if, if you're just expressing things in terms of a Big Bang, and then you're a theistic evolutionist or some other label, and you accept the Big Bang and you say, look, that's the way we say it today. God's the one who did that. It, it, it sort of has the same purpose to it, the same strategy. Maybe we should put it that way. Sure. Uh, so then when we look at like Psalms 4, should we not read it as recording an actual spiritual battle that happened, but more as borrowing the logical language to make a theological point? Right. On, on one level, it, it's all a spiritual battle because there's a spiritual being who controls chaos and subdues it and minds it. Uh, did God actually have to, you know, put up his dukes and punch out, you know, an actual dragon somewhere in the spiritual world? I don't, I don't think that's the point at all. I think what they're, what they're grappling with is they know by experience in life that things just happen. And, and I think this is the reason the sea is picked is because as, as terrestrial human beings, you can't do anything in that. I mean, it, it, it's, you're helpless. It is, you are completely at its mercy. And even if you're on a boat, I mean, there's this great fear. There's a reason why the sea is always, you know, is the candidate for the uncontrollable thing, because you can't control it in any way. So I think that's really the point, that, that we know that the natural world we live in is unpredictable and uncontrollable, but we know it got here. And so we're combining the belief that our God can control it and that it was produced. So we're combining the two ideas into that. But I don't, you know, I don't think that you have a situation where God's actually in mortal combat you know, with, with another entity. Dax. You mean you mean the things that are created sort of like in reverse order that yeah, you would expect yeah. scientifically? Yeah, I I mean I, I would I would say you're you're correct in that it doesn't really follow what anybody says because everybody's trying to make a scientific commentary out of it. Even if you're an evolutionist, you're a theistic evolutionist, you're a you know, traditional 24-hour day creationist. Everyone's trying to create a theolog or excuse me, a scientific narrative. And you can you can do some of that. Again, rationally, you can do some of that. But there are always these these places that it doesn't work. You know, Genesis one, I think it's verse 21, that the ground produced cattle. Really? I mean, an evolutionist can't justify that. Or can they? You know, what does that mean, crown produce? I mean, they can imagine their way to it. You know, if, if, if they're really creative, I think overly creative. A creationist can't do that. I mean, you, you, have, you have these thorny things. The other question is, who gets to be the literalist? I interpret the Bible literally. Really? Do you interpret everything in Genesis literally? Like there really are doors in heaven and windows in heaven and God opens and shuts them and there are bars that support the earth and bars that support the, the sky. I mean, oh no, I don't take those things literally. Why not? See, what, what, what you have here in the, in the Genesis creation fight is everybody has the perfect balance of liberal and, uh, literal and symbolic. Everybody does. My view of that is the right one. If you take one passage and you deliteralize it, you're a compromiser. If you take one passage and make it literal where I don't, oh, you're just, you just don't get it. You're just going too far with that. You know, would to God that you got the balance that I have. Okay, I mean, that, that's really what, what's happening. There's no way for everyone to agree on exactly what should be taken literally and what shouldn't be taken literally, 
and have everybody come out at the same place. And, and the debates between the, the two extremes are, are exactly that. If you made a list of all the statements, you know, you can almost categorize people by head, you know, verse count, you know, word count, literal versus non-literal. Well, if you, if you get more than 70%, you're going to be over here. And 30%, yeah, you're between these two, you know. The, the liberating thing, I think, is to just let it be what it is. Okay, they're, they're making theological statements. They're telling you what you ought to believe. Okay, they, don't, they don't have any of the wherewithal to communicate the kinds of things that we, we would want them to communicate. Again, you know, you're dealing with a world where, you know, did you know that you know, the, the reason that I, I love my wife is because my intestines tell me to do that? You know, it just... <clears throat> and, and, you know, somebody in that culture, and even in our culture, I mean, we, we know what you mean. We know. But we let it pass because we know that you're not trying to make it a scientific statement. If we thought you were, we'd probably pick up the phone and ask for, like, some assistance, okay? We have somebody here who, like, needs medical attention. Um, you know, it, we, within our culture, we, we, we let that go. Uh, my, my own way, I don't want to get too much into next week because I'm going to deal with a lot of this next week, is that <clears throat> we, we intuitively are able, if I say, I love you with all my, my heart, okay? That's not a scientific statement. My heart pumps blood. Electrical impulses go through it, and it just, okay, that's what it does. All right, there's nothing, there's nothing emotive that comes out of it. That comes here, and then it might affect me somewhere else in the gut or in, you know, the bosom here because of hormones and electrical impulse. I mean, we know all this stuff, but yet I can say that. We, we intuitively know how to distinguish between the truth claim, the, the, the guts, the real, the, real, the real thing that's being asserted, and the path it takes. I can make a completely unscientific statement, and yet my truth claim, my assertion, can be completely true, completely coherent. And because you live in my world, and we speak the same language, we don't have a language barrier, you get it like that. The problem is, is we're, we're dealing with, with an ancient document, and they're doing the same thing. They're using the language of experience, the language of, of appearances, because that's their world. And the more we immerse ourselves in their world, we can intuitively know, okay, here's how they're saying it, but here's really what, what the point is. And the point is not an error. The point is true. It's correct. The things that the Bible asserts are not mistaken. Okay, it, it, we do it with our own lives, our own experience, our own conversations. You know, it's just more difficult when it comes to a, an ancient document because it's not our native culture. There's a gap. You do realize that the context for understanding the Bible is not the Protestant Reformation. It's not the Roman Catholic Church. It's not 20th century or 21st century evangelicalism. The context for the Old Testament is the context that produced it, which we don't have anymore. We have vestiges of it. We have memories of it. We have a few artifacts here and there that help us to sort of you know, piece that together. But that, that's the ambition of the biblical interpreter, to try to think their thoughts after them. And it's difficult. It's an imperfect process. The problem isn't with the text. The problem is up here, okay? It's the gap. And too often the text gets blamed for our deficiencies, which is another place I love to take people who are errantists. Again, I, I use words like inspiration and inerrancy because I know the problem is really you, okay, and me. You're making the statement you're making for completely understandable reasons because you were born in 1961 <laughs> in America. I mean, you know, all these things. 
But, but you're not judging it for what it is. You're judging it for what you want to shoot at it for. That's just hardly fair. Anybody else have a question? I know I rambled there a little bit, but yes. Characters? There, yeah, I, I, I know, I know whereof you speak. I mean, there, there, there is, there has been an effort made to align these things. Um, I would say this: I think there is, there are certain Greek texts, again, cosmologies and you know, primeval history stuff. You know, their, their version of it. There are certain texts where you can strike some correlations, and and they are they are really interesting. Um, but there are other places where they just fall flat. So I, I think it, part part of the reason for that is there's a very expensive book, and if any of you can feel it in your heart to spend one hundred and sixty five dollars. <laughs> On this book, I would just love to have. <laughs> no, it, it's it's just it's ridiculous. It's by a guy named uh, West. Is his last name? It's called the East Face of the Helicon, and it's a scholarly work, and it shows how the, all the Greek mythologies are backdropped by ancient Near Eastern stuff. They just bleed into it. Uh, so there, there's a lot to that. I, I think it would be overstating uh, the case to say that you could align that material with most of the biblical characters, like let's say in Genesis 1 to 11. You don't have that many characters anyway. But, um, but there, there is something to it, but it's not... It, it's, an, it's an issue of detail and... and you know, frequency coverage, I guess, might be a better word to put it. Better way to put it. Um, you get some really striking things uh, out of the text that the New Testament also picks up on. If you ever want to do an interesting study, uh, do a, a Greek word study on the word Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. That comes right out of out of secular Greek texts, and it's for the bad place. But Peter uses it in a very interesting place that matches with how it's used in Greek mythology. Again, it, it's, it's theological polemic. But you, know, you, you don't get as much of it in the... Usually when the New Testament's doing that, it's, it's, it's going back to the old, you know, because that's, that's the canon. Uh, that, that's the consciousness of the writer. Yes, questions, anything else? Mm -hmm. And they all should be. That's the shame of it. <laughs> you will, you will be, you will be amazed at what you can learn. I said this last week. I, I think I'm going to essentially repeat it. But um, Bible dictionaries and Bible encyclopedias are wonderful things. Now, if you, I, I don't want to, I want you all to think that I've invested all this time and, and uh, boy, there's just secrets that, that only Mike can tap into. But I'm going to try to destroy that here in the next two minutes. If you learned transliteration, Greek and Hebrew, what the English characters are for the, for the Hebrew and Greek characters, and you bought things like Anchor Bible Dictionary and especially 
Dictionary of Deity and Demons in the Bible, which is the only reference source I've ever had that I could just read cover to cover. I've read most of it. it it's just, that's like devotional reading. Okay. It's just, <laughs> it's just wonderful. <laughs> but there are, there are key sources like that that are designed for people who just know English and transliteration. And they'll take you into all sorts of stuff. So use reference material. Now, the other thing that I recommended is start thinking, start looking for vocabulary and phrasing touch points between passages. The scholarly term for that is intertextuality. You can impress someone or bore someone with that later. Intertextuality. And that's the idea that biblical writers read the stuff that came before them. And they're drawing connections. Like, wow, who'd have thought of that? Uh, they do it all the time. Because they assume, a biblical writer assumes, that you know that stuff really well. So they only need to drop a phrase or a word or two or three words in one cluster. And they, they think you're tracking. Read, let me put it this way, learn to read your Bible like it's a novel. You know, you all have this experience. When you read novels and you're reading two characters dialoguing, we've all had this experience where we'll read something and you'll go, I just, I'll bet that he had that character say that specifically because he's going to reference it later. And you just sort of store it away. Or this place that he described, it seems like it's important. I'm going to try to remember the description because the writer may allude to that later, and I'm supposed to make the mental connection. It's plotting, okay? If you read it like a novel, the biblical writers do that all the time. They're not going to go back and repeat everything in the Old Testament. They're just going to drop names and places, little words here and there, phrases, because they assume you know it that well. And if you read it like fiction, like it's a story, you can start to pick up on some of that, even in English. Oh, wait, where have I seen that term before? That two or three terms clustered together. Oh, yeah. It's, or you can use, you know, use software. Chances are if you see like four words together in one passage and the same four words occur together in a cluster in another one, there's probably something going on there. Okay, and you can go look it up. But there, there's all sorts of techniques you can use like that. It's just, it's just you have to sort of develop a sense for, for plotting you know, for, for strategy. The writers have strategy. They're not just filling up space. They're doing things that are deliberate. Anybody else? Thank you. Mm -hmm.